welcome to the final episode of Plant Stars, the talk show where I introduce you to my house plants. Um, I'm going to reintroduce you to one I've already talked about before, and that is my passion flower vine that I have growing in my house. You can actually see it right here. Um, and I wanted to show you one of the tendrils on it because it will be relevant to today's lecture. So this is a tendril that I snipped off of the plant. Um, they use these tendrils because they're really thin, the vines are really thin, they use these tendrils to support themselves and we're going to talk about why certain plants have these tendrils and how they form today. There's one all stretched out. Now had this tendril hit any sort of object while it was growing, it would have grown this coil around it but it didn't hit anything and so it just wrapped itself around like this. So this is from uh, the passion flower vine in my house. And then also I wanted to introduce you to this plant, which is a tiny little coffee tree that I've been growing. Um, and this will be relevant today because we're gonna talk about caffeine um, and other molecules that are produced by plants and used by people. So let's get into it, our last lecture on plants. For our last lecture on plants, today we're going to talk about um, how plants respond to the environments that they're growing in, and we're also going to talk about the hormones that they express um, to grow in those environments. So first let's talk about how they respond to gravity. I covered this a little bit in the last video. Um, when a plant exhibits a response to the Earth's gravitational pull, that is called gravitropism, um, the shoots are going to have negative gravitropism and the roots are going to have positive gravitropism. What that means is that the shoots are always going to grow away from the pull of where gravity is coming from and then the roots are always going to grow towards the pull of gravity. Soil is on the ground which surrounds the earth which has a gravitational pull at its center and so it makes sense that the roots would go towards that gravity where the soil is and the shoots would grow up and away from that where the sun is. Um, how this happens is that in uh, negative gravitropism, the lower side cells um, will grow more rapidly, and then on the roots, the upper side cells will grow more rapidly, and that causes a curvature towards or away from that gravitational pull. Plants also um, have mechanisms for dealing with mechanical stretch, stress, which is usually um, tearing of the leaves that could be caused by um, chewing or um, anything that involves um, the actual movement of the plant is what we're going to talk about here. Um, there are some plants that have um, a reversible mechanical stress, reversible response to mechanical stress in that they can... Um, move one way and then move the other. One example are mimosa plants. If you touch these leaves, like you can see in these pictures, this is one that hasn't been touched. And this is what happens after you've touched that. They're called sensitive plants because after you like brush the leaves, they'll close up in this way. Um, this is a response to mechanical stress and they use these um, unique cells that they have at the base of their leaves to cause this change. So um, the blades of mimosa leaves are divided into numerous leaflets that you can see here. Um, and at the base of each of these little leaflets that you see here is a swollen structure called a pulvenus. Multiple pulvenus venus are pulvini. Um, and changes in the turgor pressure within the pulvenus are going to cause the leaflets to fold in response to a stimulus. So when the leaves are touched by a human or by an animal or something brushing against it, the ions that are in the pulvenus are going to move to the outside of that structure. Water is going to follow by osmosis, and then that causes decreased interior turgor pressure, which leads to the folding in response to being, being touched. You can also have thigmotropism, which is an irreversible um, response. This is the, that wrapping of tendrils that I showed you in my passion flower vine. Um, so this is direct, thigmotropism is directional growth of a plant or a plant part in response to contact with an object, an animal, another plant, or even the wind. Um, and so 
In terms of things like the wind, plants, uh, if the plants are growing in high wind areas, they're able to grow thicker and shorter internodes in their continued growth in response to that wind so that they can withstand that pressure from the wind. Um, and then you also have the wrapping of the tendrils like I showed you in my passion flower vine. Um, and so thigmotropism is the directional growth of a plant or plant part in response to contact with an object, an animal, another plant, or even the wind. Um, and then you can have heliotropism, which is reversible. This is when a plant will grow in orientation to the sun. Um, and this is, again, like the mimosa plant, this, is, this changes in response to variations in turgor pressure that allow the plant to rotate. Um, so perfect example are sunflowers. Sunflowers will rotate throughout the day in orientation to where the sun is, and this helps them maximize photosynthesis um, by facing um, and getting as much photosynthetically active radiation as they can. So heliotropism is a, uh, a change in position based on where the sun is. This is reversible. Thigmotropism, repeated that already, and then... Um, Mimosa plants, which have this reversible touch stimulus, um, that's also involved involves with turgor pressure, and it's a specialized action caused by these pulvini at the base of the leaflets. Plants can also have um, responses to variations in water and temperature available and temperatures in the environment. Um, some of these effects can be short-term and some of these can be long-term depending on how long um, that temperature period or that water availability period lasts. Um, dormancy is when you have a delay in growth during unfavorable conditions, uh, so things like winter. Um, and then you can have abscission, which is a different response of a plant to water and temperature availability, and that's when leaves and petals are shed by the plant. And so here is... a um, a diagram showing an abscission zone on a plant. An abscission is a perfect example of abscission is when the deciduous plants that we have a lot of here in Pennsylvania will shed their leaves. First they change color because they're reabsorbing nutrients from those leaves before they enter dormancy and then they shed those leaves via abscission. So deciduous trees um, like the trees that are growing here like maples um, and oak trees there's a lot of those growing on campus at St. Vincent. When they are shedding their leaves, that is um, abscission. And then when they are in the winter period, that's when they enter their dormancy period because they, they delay their, their growth. Um, you can also have um, responses to water and temperature in seeds during embryonic development. Seeds usually enter a dormant period during um, a dry season, so here around here in Pennsylvania, it might be during the winter um, when there's not a lot of uh, waters either frozen um, or not really available. Um, in this figure here, this is just showing a, a seed that's entering a dormancy period. So there, what happens um, bef at the initiation of dormancy in seeds that enter a dormant state is they first they accumulate food reserves so that they can last during the dormant period. Um, then they form a protective seed coat, and then they dehydrate. Um, and so those are all different steps that are involved in accumulating those food reserves. So accumulating food reserves, forming a pre protective seed coat, and then dehydration. And a hormone that's needed for this dormancy initiation is abscisic acid. Um, and plants will need abscisic acid from the mother plant and from embryonic tissue. We're going to talk about what abscisic acid is as a hormone in plants in just a second. But first, let's talk about auxins. Um, auxins, and all of this should be review from lab two. So if you want, um, obviously use your textbook to help study this material. But um, your lab manual covers what these hormones do as well when we were doing the um, pea plant growth experiment before our pre-isolation period. Um, auxins are going to increase the plasticity of cell walls and stimulate growth of the plant. They're um, produced in the top of the plant and moved down. You should remember that from the lab that you get 
auxins produced in the tip of the plant and then they move down the stem. There's a really cool section in your textbook that I'm not going to go over in detail in this video is about experiments that Charles Darwin did with his son to look at, well, he didn't know he was looking at hormone development at the time, but he like wrapped aluminum foil around the caps of plants to look at how they bent, bent themselves towards the light. And basically what this auxin does is it's a hormone that's produced based on the orientation of light hitting the plant, and then it causes that plant to um, change its growth rates in different cells so that it can maximize photosynthesis and orient itself to the light. So what's happening in this plant is the light source is coming in here, right? Auxins are being produced at the tip. So light's coming in here, that light hits the plant, causes auxin expression through the plant from top to the bottom, and then what's happening is it's causing the cells on the dark side of the plant to elongate and grow longer than the sides on the light side, so then it bends towards the light. And this is sort of similar to what happens when you've got that gravotropism where one part of it is growing faster and longer than the other side, which causes it to bend in shape. So I'm gonna go over that again. The light, hits a plant, if it's coming from one direction, it's the auxins that are produced at the tip of that plant and run through that are then gonna cause, are gonna stimulate growth on the dark side of the plant so that the cells get longer and bigger than the cells on the light side, causing the plant to bend over towards the light. So auxins are really important for helping plants maximize um, their exposure to light. Now let's talk about cytokinins. Um, cytokinins are called cytokinins because they were um, found to promote the synthesis or activation of proteins that are specifically required for cytokinesis. So if you remember cytokinins, cytokinesis, that'll help you remember that they're involved in um, cell division and differentiation. And actually, if you read through your textbook, you can see that um, the first time they discovered cytokinins was they had to use coconut milk in growing cells and culture um, because coconut milk was rich in these cytokinins and it helped them grow, um, help scientists grow plants in the lab. So that's pretty cool. Um, and cytokinins work in concert with auxins to stimulate cell division and differentiation in plants. Um, the sources of cytokinins are going to be different. Now, we just talked about how auxin is produced in the apex of the plant. Cytokinins are produced in root meristems and in fruits. And they produce, they promote the growth of side branches on the stems. Auxins actually inhibit that. So auxins will inhibit side branches and encourage growth upwards. And then they'll inhibit the growth of lateral roots, which auxins stimulate. So they, that's how they work in concert with each other. Um, if you apply cytokinins to leaves of that have been detached from a plant, it actually will s slow the progress of those leaves turning yellow once they've detached from the main plant. So they can also function in anti-aging in plants too because they're involved in cell division. So remember cytokinins are involved in cytokinesis and therefore they help stimulate cell division. Now let's talk about gibberellins or gibberellic acid. Um, gibberellins are actually named after a fungus called Gibberella fujikuro, um, and it's a fungus that causes rice plants to grow abnormally tall when it parasitizes them. And so these were first discovered in a parasite of plants, um, but then were later found to be produced by plants um, to aid in growth and the elongation of stems, which again, this should all be reviewed from your lab uh, as well. So gibberellins are produced in the apical portion of the root and in the stems. Um, they're important in the elongation of stems for growing upwards. Um, this is a, these are actually really similar to the plants that we talked about in lab. This is a dwarf one, a dwarf pea plant, and this is a normal pea plant. A lot of dwarf plants actually lack gibberellin, so you might have noticed when you grew your pea plants in lab that when you applied that gibberellic acid to the dwarf pea plants, they grew a little taller um, than your control plants. Um, and that's because those dwarf ones we were growing specifically lack 
the production of the gibberellic acid, which helps elongate the stem. Um, in germination of seeds, they activate amylase, um, and then they provide energy for the growth of the plant from the seeds. So that helps them break down um, that endosperm that has all these stored energy reserves. Um, so amylase is, will break down sugars, and so that endosperm gets digested um, because of activation by GA, and then that helps the plant grow. Another important plant hormone that we, I want to cover is ethylene. Um, hopefully some of you know a little bit about this, like why you keep some fruit. If you want um, a fruit to ripen faster, you might put it in a paper bag on your kitchen counter. Um, and that's because of ethylene, um, which is a gaseous hydrocarbon. Um, and it's stimulated by auxins to prevent lateral bud, bud development, but it's also involved in fruit ripening. Um, so it stimulates a, the breakdown of carbohydrates, um, and also um, chlorophyll is broken down in fruit, the cell wall is softened, and then there's also the release of volatile chemicals. So what's really cool is that because plants are using hormonal control to determine when their fruits are ripened, they can make sure that the fruit isn't ripe before the seed in there is ready to be eaten. So we've talk, I've talked about this in the last lecture. The whole point of fruits is that they encourage animals to eat the seeds and then poop those seeds out somewhere else so that the plant can continue to grow somewhere else and disperse. But they don't want an animal to eat that fruit before the seed in it is ready to be eaten. And so they'll, they'll delay that ripening until they're ready and then they'll produce ethylene gas. That ethylene will then make those, will make them smell really good to attract um, animals to come and eat them. It'll soften it so it's easier to digest for that animal. Um, and then it'll also make it tastier by breaking down those carbohydrates and making them more sugary. So this is all, all this, all the ripening of fruit is so that it's enticing for animals to eat and dis disperse those seeds when they're ready. Um, in the production of tomatoes, um, har most tomatoes are actually harvested green and then uh, growers will apply ethylene gas to ripen them um, before they're released to market. You, a lot of other fruit shipments are actually shipped with carbon dioxide gas because carbon dioxide can actually stop the ripening of fruit in shipment. So if something is picked ripe from a, a tree or from a, a plant, then growers can add carbon dioxide gas to that shipment so that they don't spoil before they get to market. Um, yeah, so really important uh, hormone. Now let's talk about abscisic acid. I mentioned this earlier. It's also called dormin, which I think is a really intuitive name for this hormone. Um, and this induces the formation of winter buds on plants. So um, one thing that it does is it causes the formation of scales. So this little brown piece that you see around the bud, those are called bud scales. And those will protect the buds from drying out in the winter when there's less water available. I mean, it also counteracts GA activity. So abscisic acid is going to slow the growth that's usually induced by those gimbarellins. Um, you can also see abscisic acid produced in um, stressed plants. Um, so if a plant is stressed, maybe it's not getting enough nutrition or maybe it's not getting enough water, um, it might start to express abscisic acid so that it grows slower and doesn't need as much water or nutrition to grow. Um, so it can slow its growth that way. Um, it's also really important, like I said earlier, in um, dormancy in seeds. Here you can see, uh, and also dormancy in bulbs, things that grow from bulbs. So you can see here in this onion bulb, this would be um, a dormant um, bulb that is growing very slowly and saving its resources from when there's water and nutrition available and sunlight as well. Um, but if it enters out of that dormancy period, so abscisic acid is produced here, um, if that bulb enters out of its dormant period, then it'll start to grow again. So those are plant hormones. Let's talk a little bit about how plants defend themselves. So um, 
one common problem for plants is that they're tasty. Um, they produce fruit for animals to eat, but it's a big problem if they eat them before that, and it's also a really big problem when animals try to eat leaf or stem tissue or an entire plant whole. And plants have to figure, have evolved along with their herbivore predator, herbivores, long enough that they've developed some evolutionary mechanisms to deal with this threat of herbivory. Um, and one of the first lines of defense against herbivores are these physical barriers. So you remember that the outer layer of plants contains that dermal layer, and then this dermal layer can have a waxy cuticle or a cutin layer on the outside, and then that, that waxy cuticle forms a seal around the outside of the, of the plant to prevent herbivores from biting through it or um, piercing through it with sucking mouth parts or through, from burrowing through the tissue. That thick, thick waxy layer is one line of defense that plants can have. Um, these layers might also have trichomes that we talked about before, and sometimes those trichomes can secrete toxic substances or stuff that just tastes really bad um, to prevent animals from eating them. Under the dermal layer, particularly in roots, um, we talked about that Casparian strip that's important in the regulation of uh, water uptake. And in the Casparian strip, there's um, a waxy compound called Subarin, which can help to further protect the plant from herbivores. And so that's just some waxy and physical things that plants can do to protect themselves. Um, physical defenses usually aren't enough, though, to protect a plant from getting eaten. Um, a lot of these protective measures are very easily eaten by animals and fungi. Sometimes they have hardened mouth parts that are specifically meant for chewing through these waxy layers or through trichomes. Um, when plant roots are growing underground, they come in contact with rocks and hard material in the soil. Um, and while we talked about that mucigel that they can make that helps secrete them, sometimes that's not enough. And that soil particles can tear holes in the dermal layer. And then those holes, those are basically entry wounds through which um, nematodes and other small animals can then enter into their roots and start feeding on them. Um, that's one entryway into, inside of a plant for herbivores to feed on. Another is that um, all plants um, must leave open their stoma from time to time to allow for gas exchange. Entering through those holes is another perfect location for fungal spores um, to enter the leaves or other parts of the plant. Um, and this may be a good way for mycorrhizae to enter root cells uh, through that other way that I talked about um, when you get those tears or those holes in the roots, that might be a good way for mycorrhizae to enter the root cells, but not all fungi are beneficial, and some will harm or even kill the plant. So those are physical defenses. That's kind of like that first line of defense, um, but most plants have a little more than just a physical defense. Some of them also have a chemical defense. Um, chemicals that are produced by a plant but that are not required for the growth of the plant are called secondary metabolites. Um, I'm going to repeat that again because that's an important definition. Chemicals that are produced by the plant but are not required for the growth of the plant are called secondary metabolites. Um, and these are produced through side pathways of normal metabolism that plants are able to take advantage of to protect themselves from herbivores. And so um, that's why they're called secondary metabolites, is that they're produced in um, chemical pathways that are offshoots of normal metabolism. Uh, one example, um, one really prevalent example are tannins. Tannins will bind to other proteins and inhibit their activity. Um, so by binding to the digestive enzymes in the guts of herbivore insects, they inhibit the digestion of the material. Um, so the, the insect might be eating it, but it's not actually getting any nutrition from it, and it can lead it to starve to death. Um, tannins can be really high in immature fruit, and that's important because it keeps them from getting eat, being eaten until the seeds are fully formed. So um, if you try to eat um, an apple or a tomato or something before it's ripe, it might taste really bitter, and that's because of things like tannins. Um, Oak leaves are also a really great example of a plant tissue that produces tannins, um, and that just keeps the leaves from being eaten.
Another example are alkaloids. Um, our favorite one that's produced by my little coffee tree that I have in my house is caffeine. Nicotine is another one. Um, cocaine and morphine, these are all um, made in plants. Um, and these are a class of chemicals that are shown to have activity within the nervous system of insects. And to some extent in humans, obviously, that's why we all drink coffee. Um, if the plant doesn't kill the insect from exposure when it's making one of these alkaloids, um, it will at least incapacitate it for a little bit. Um, so if any of you have ever had, like, you know, way too many Red Bulls or something when you're staying up all night to study and you get really jittery, basically the same kind of thing happens to um, insects that eat these alkaloids that affect their nervous system. Um, some of these plant types of compounds can even be quite toxic to humans. Um, one example is ricin. It's a um, very, very deadly toxin um, that's found in castor beans. Um, so some of these are really, really bad and you can't eat them at all. We'll talk a little bit about some of these a little more in a little more detail in a, in a little bit. Another example of a secondary metabolite are cyanogenic compounds. Um, and these are things that will release cyanide. So they have um, a, a cyanide molecule bonded to them. And then when they're digested by anything that eats it, then that cyanide is released and will um, poison them. So, yeah, these are all chemicals that contain cyanide or a derivative of cyanide. Um, and these, key, these chemicals are able to block electron transfer in mitochondria, which is a pretty fundamental universal process that all cells need to perform so if an animal can't make ATP then it's going to die pretty quickly. Um, you can also have um, in addition to actual toxins like secondary metabolites you can also have repellents. Um, that's anything that's stinky and repels something from eating it. Um, two really great examples are peppermint and sage. We might think they smell nice um, but imagine you were a tiny, tiny insect. If you got a high dose of a peppermint or a sage volatile, um, that might be really, really intense and overpowering for you. Um, and so there's those, those plants like sage and mint produce those chemicals to help deter insects from eating them. There's also um, a specific kind of chemical defense called allelopathy. Um, some plants will secrete toxic chemicals through their roots to prevent other plants from growing near the plant's roots. These chemicals will act to block the germination of seeds, which means the plant will limit competition for nutrients in the soil. This might also be important for pre to prevent potential shading out. So um, if the competing plant that's trying to grow in the soil near the tree can grow a lot faster than that plant, um, it may block out the sun. And so the, the, these allelopathic chemicals that are grown in the roots will s slow down its growth so it doesn't get shaded out. Um, black walnuts are a perfect example of allelopathy. Um, they produce a chemical called jugone in their roots. Um, and if you've ever seen any black walnut trees, we have a lot that are growing around St. Vincent. Um, there's very little growth besides grasses underneath those trees because of the jugone that's produced in their roots. So why are all these chemicals that these plants produce not harmful to the plants that are making them? Um, some of these chemicals that they're making actually act on mechanisms that are in the plants themselves, such as those cyanide compounds, if they're interfering with electron transport and mitochondria, plants got those too. So how are they protecting themselves from the toxins that they're producing? One is through packaging. So the plant can keep the toxin packaged inside membrane-bound vesicles, um, which have to be broken. So if a, like a caterpillar is chewing in the plant, then it'll break open those vesicles and release those toxins. Um, Another thing that they can do is they might produce it in an inactive form um, that has to be broken down by digestive animal enzymes in the animal for it to be toxic. Um, most of the really strong toxins that are produced by plants are made in an inactive form by the plant, 
and it's only after that toxin is digested by the animal eating the plant that it's gonna be released and become activated. Cyanogenic glycosides are a really perfect example of this. Um, these are sugar molecules which contain a cyanide group, but they'll be inactive until that sugar is digested after being eaten. So let's talk a little bit about um, some of these quote-unquote plant toxins and how they've been used to improve human health. Um, although the toxins are chemical defenses plants have developed, um, can have detrimental effects on insects or other plants that they're meant to be deterring because they have this really long evolutionary history with each other, humans have started to isolate these chemicals and have found that many of them are very useful for human health. Um, you know some of these already that we talked about, like caffeine. I drink it literally all day <laughs> because I need it. Maybe I should take a little bit of a break now that I'm just in my house. But I love caffeine. Um, isolation of chemicals in plants has become a really major industry. And there are drug companies that regularly send groups into the rainforest and other isolated areas to collect specimens of a plant and then isolate the different secondary metabolites to test for health properties at low concentrations. A lot of drugs that are derived from plants are based on traditional treatments developed by indigenous people in all over the world, and these treatments are often the starting point for drug companies um, to then develop those um, and put them on the market. Um, some of the drugs which have been developed from these in, from this indigenous knowledge are commonly used today. Um, some exam some examples of those are uh, morphine is a perfect example. Morphine um, and its related opioids originally came from opium poppies. Um, it's now commonly used as a painkiller and, and anesthesia. Salicylic acid, um, which is an aspirin, is another great example. This comes from the bark of willow trees and um, is derived from knowledge from indigenous populations. Um, tannins are also a great example. So um, as I talked about already, they're able to bind to the proteins in digestive tract and inhibit digestion. And if you take tannins in small doses, so like a cup of tea, or maybe the tannins that might be in a glass of red wine, um, those can have a calming effect on digestive processes. A lot of anti there have also been a lot of anti-cancer drugs that have been developed based on secondary metabolites in plants that have been discovered. One example is Taxol. Um, this is one of the most common drugs that's used for the treatment of breast cancer. Um, and it was originally isolated from yew trees, which are right here. Um, another one is a chemical that was isolated from periwinkle plants has been shown to function as an anti-cancer drug. Um, another really, really important uh, compound in terms of human medical history is quinine, uh, which is used as, is still commonly used as an anti-malarial drug. Um, a lot of British soldiers that were colonizing areas in the tropics like to drink gin and ton tonics. And one reason for drinking gin and tonic water is that um, because of the quinine that's in tonic water um, is anti has anti-malarial effects. And it comes from the bark of a uh, chinchona tree. Um, and there are literally thousands of these kinds of chemicals that are made for the defense of plants. Um, and... A lot of them have yet to be discovered what the properties are that they might have. Um, and there's still really active um, biodiscovery research going on in, um, well, it's called bioprospecting when you look for these types of compounds uh, in plants that could be beneficial to human health. So you might be asking yourself, this stuff can, is toxic. Why don't they kill humans? One main reason is the dosage. A lot of these chemicals that are listed that I've listed here have been carefully tested. We know how much to give to have the de desired effects without having any sort of negative side effects. Um, so if you think about morphine, for example, if you take too much morphine, your heart rate slows so much that it could stop and then you could die. Um, 
but when we control the dose, it can function as a very effective painkiller. Um, also, in some cases, humans are going to metabolize a lot of these compounds that are meant to kill insects a lot differently than their insect targets, and so they're not going to be nearly as toxic to humans as they will be to insects. Now let's talk about um, mutualisms in ant, ant plant defenses. Um, some plants have co-evolved uh, with animals and have developed this um, mutualistic relationship where they provide usually a food resource or housing to an animal, and in response, that animal protects them from that plant from herbivores. Um, one really awesome example that you'll hear about when you take my ecology class are ants and the acacia tree. So acacia trees provide um, nectar and these things called extra floral nectaries. So these are literal sugary spots on the plant that are meant just to feed these ants. They also have holes inside their stems that the ants can live in. And so they provide shelter and food for these ants. And in response, they will attack any herbivores that are trying to feed on it. This poor cicada is just like, getting mauled and bitten to death by these ants. Um, and so the, that's the benefit that the acacia tree gets for providing shelter inside their stems and then food through those extra floral nectaries. Um, and there are a lot of plants that specifically have mutualisms formed with ants for those ants to then defend the plant from herbivores. Um, this is one of my favorite examples in that um, the relationship between some species of parasitic wasps, um, the caterpillars that they lay their eggs inside of, and the leaves that the caterpillars feed on. This here is an example of a tomato hornworm with a um, Cotesia parasitoid wasp that's going to come and lay its eggs in it. So what's happening in this photo is that chomp, 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 chomp. Well, this diagram is not a photo. This caterpillar is going chomp, 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 chomp eating this leaf. That leaf is producing chemicals. Um, it may be a combination of uh, volatile chemicals that go through the air plus anything that's the, the saliva of the caterpillar. So sometimes it's a combination of the saliva of the caterpillar plus this aerosolized stuff that the plant will produce in response to this caterpillar feeding that kind of sends out a bat signal to the wasps to be like, oh, there's a nice juicy caterpillar on that plant for me to lay my eggs in. So the plant's like, Sandy, hen, help, help me, wasp. You're our only hope. And then the wasp comes in and is like, ooh, look at this big juicy caterpillar. And you can see right here, it's sticking its uh, egg-laying structure. It's not a stinger. It's called an ovipositor. It injects its eggs into that caterpillar. And then the larvae eat and feed on the inside of the caterpillar and then they bust out of it. Um, you might have seen, if you guys ever grow tomato plants, um, you might have seen these caterpillars with all these little white things all over them. Those are the cocoons of developing wasp larvae. They're going to bust out of that caterpillar. And so what happens is the caterpillar basically just turns into a house for the developing larvae and it stops eating the plant. And so plant sends out a bat signal or a wasp signal to the wasp. Wasp's like, I'll send help, injects its eggs into the caterpillar. The eggs and the larvae then eat the caterpillar from the inside out, and then they develop as little cocoons on the caterpillar, and it stops the caterpillar from eating that plant. Super cool. Um, so let's talk a little more about what um, this kind of wound response that happens in these plants when they get eaten by herbivores like a caterpillar. Um, so let's say a leaf is damaged like this. Caterpillar came in and chomp, chomp, chomped on it. It releases this chemical called systemin that goes throughout the plant. That systemin travels through the plant and then um, leaves with the systemin receptor in them are they going to produce something called jasmonic acid. Sometimes this jasmonic acid itself will be released as a volatile by the plant that then the wasps can detect. Sometimes it's another volatile. Um, sometimes it's a combination of the volatile plus the saliva that the caterpillar produces. That then, that jasmonic acid, not only might it signal the wasp to come to the plant, 
but it's also going to activate these things called protease inhibitors. And what these protease inhibitors do is they bind to digestive enzymes in the gut of the caterpillar that's eating the plant, so then it slows down and it stops eating as much. And so they, so the chomp, 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 caterpillar eats the leaf, leaf makes systemin, systemin um, binds to receptors in the leaves, those receptors are then like, hey, we gotta make some jasmonic acid. That jasmonic acid is gonna then activate protease inhibitors. The leaves are still gonna start making all these protease inhibitors in their tissue. So then while the caterpillar is eating, it's gonna hit something that's then gonna slow it down and stop it from feeding. Um, so that's a plant's response to an herbivore, but they also have some specific responses that they might um, develop in response to pathogens, so things like um, a fungus that might infect the plant. Um, one type is called a hypersensitivity response that's formed at the site of infection. Um, and what this does is it blocks the transmission of the pathogen and then releases a signal molecule. So this hypersensitivity response is going to result in rapid cell death around the source of the invasion in longer term whole plant resistance, not long, long term, but just like um, longer than just a few minutes. So what it does is it causes cell death around where it got wounded by the pathogen um, to seal off those wounded tissues. And then it could also in produce chemicals that could help kill the infection. So that's the hypersensitive response. Um, and it's much more short-term short than a systemic acquired response. Um, this can last for a period of days and it allows the plant to respond more quickly if it gets eaten again. And so this is like a chomp, chomp, chomp on the plant and then it releases um, salicylic acid is one of the signal molecules, but then it might produce something else that um, one of the other chemicals that we talked about earlier to make it more resistant to that pathogen infecting that tissue again. But it's not, it may sound like it, but it's not really anything like the antibody response or the human immunity um, because it's not nearly as specific or as long lasting as he, human immunity. It only lasts for a few period of days after it's been um, challenged by a pathogen. So it's a hypersensitivity response and then the systemic acquired resistance. This one's more short-term, this one's more long-term, and this one involves cell death. This one does not involve cell death. And that's it. That's everything for the plant exam. Um, we'll have our uh, exam review tomorrow during class. Um, so make sure you watch this before our exam on Wednesday, and then after the exam and after our break, then we'll start talking about fungi. Okay, see you soon, bye.